Well, good morning, Family Church, wherever you're watching from. I hope you're enjoying a study as we walk through the book of Philippians. Um, this book to me is one of the ones that I have read many times. And as we walk through it, I love that we're slowing down a little bit and just pressing in to kind of some of the depth of what the Apostle Paul had to share with us as he was imprisoned. We just want to keep that in the forefront. Um, the level of his imprisonment, there's kind of some question about that. But the fact is, he was restricted in such a way that he refers to it over and over again as being imprisoned. But in his imprisonment, we want to keep looking at this book and challenging ourselves in a way that uh, as he encouraged the, the church of Philippi, I hope that it's encouraging you, but also challenging you in the hope that he had as he wrote there, as he presented his uh, interaction with God and then tried to help share with you what God has for you through his words. So um, one of the things that is clear in this book is that Paul's joy has not been uh, determined by his circumstances. He's had lots of difficulties. In fact, that his joy is clearly in his hope in Christ. And we're going to see that, I believe, on full display today. So if you want to open up to Philippians chapter 1, we'll get into that in a moment. Because as I was preparing, I couldn't help but think of a, a history that I have and that has to do way back in 1992. Some of you are going, that's not way back. And others are going, wow, that's a long time ago because I wasn't even born yet. But in 1992, I met this beautiful woman and her name was Jennifer. And Jennifer uh, would obviously, uh, for those that know me, become my wife. And uh, 28, 28 years later, we've been together. But I'm reflecting during this preparation for the week on 1992, because 1992, for those that aren't familiar with that era, uh, this was on the verge of a lot of change. Uh, first of all, there was no cell phone technology that was just massively used. It was available, but only for elite, very restricted use. There was no email. Uh, email was available in the kind of the, the sector of business, but not in just the private or public world sense, everybody using it. Uh, there was no text, no Instagram or TikTok or whatever platform you use, Facebook. There was two general methods of communication, and they were a phone attached to a landline and letters. And so I met Jennifer we had had some history from the years past because of family, friends, and relationships, but, but really came into contact with her while I was on leave from the Marine Corps. And uh, we, we just hit it off and be, began to realize, wow, this is, this is going somewhere, I believe. But see, I had to go back to Hawaii, and she was living in Oregon. And, and so our time to talk was greatly diminished. Um, some of you freak out when you send a text and you don't get a reply in like seven seconds. Well, in this time of our life, a phone call would be, could be as much as 30 bucks, $30 for a phone call and up, of course, depending on how long you talked. And then, of course, there's letters. And letters don't show up in seven seconds or seven minutes or even sometimes seven days but we began writing letters back and forth. And I can't help but think of what it was like for the church of Philippi when they maybe heard there's a letter coming or when they received a letter from Paul. I want you to get this picture because you see, this was an exciting time in life for me and my focus was fully on this relationship. You see, I looked forward to the next letter. I reread the previous letters. I wrote the next letter I would send. We would get a phone call about weekly if we could coordinate the time zone difference and then the cost. We had, to, we had to figure out, could we afford it? And through this process, I realized that my eyes were focused on what would become my future wife. There was nothing that was going to take me off that focus. There was, uh, there was no hardship. There was no, uh, nothing, whether I had to go back to Oregon or she came to Hawaii, I was focused, she was focused, and we couldn't wait to find that time when we would come back together. Should we read a couple of uh, the old stories and, and hear what Jennifer had to say? Uh, no, those are for me. <laughs> those are private. 
And uh, I just think what I want you to get a picture of is imagine what it's like for these people in Philippi when they got a letter from Paul. So today's title is Focused. How is your focus? See, Paul, I will argue through this, has a very focused attention on the gospel and his plan and purpose for his life in partnership with Jesus through the Holy Spirit to fulfill this great commission of proclaiming the gospel. So if you want to open up to uh, chapter 1 there, verse 18 in Philippians, I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to put it up on the screen. And I just want you to follow along. You might circle things that stand out to you. But I want you to hear, continue in his heart. Last week, remember, he's still imprisoned. He was talking about, hey, if Christ is preached, even if it's for the wrong motivation, he celebrates in that. And that's why we're kind of halfway through verse 18, where he says this. He says, yes, I will rejoice. Regardless of how people are proclaiming Jesus, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me is live to live, excuse me, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And if I, to, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Do you hear his heart? Do you hear his passion for Jesus? Do you hear his commitment? And do you hear his focus? Out of this passage comes this famous quote that many of you uh, know. You recite it, perhaps. You share it. You tweet it and you text it. It's on T-shirts and bumper stickers. It's on coffee mugs and in cards. And you, you distribute this, and maybe even you yourself, you've said it, you've read it, and you've even uh, declared it. But here's the question, do you really believe it? Do you really believe that living is Christ and dying is gain, that both are for the benefit of the glory of God? Or is this a motto rather than a true lifestyle? Is this just a slogan or is it a direction in your life? To live as Christ and to die as gain. The interesting thing about this statement is that Paul here is very clearly wrestling with two very realistic outcomes. He may be killed in persecution for his faith. And he's aware of that. This is not a, I want to, uh, you know, do whatever it takes so that my life ends to be with Jesus. He says, if what it takes is my death through persecution to bring glory to God, he says, man, that's a gain. Not only is Christ proclaimed in that, but I get to be with Christ in heaven. It's a gain. It's a win-win. But he says also, but to live is also Christ. It's another kind of gain because I have work to do that I'm called to. And I love how he wrestles with this, because he realizes if his execution day comes, this is still a win. So to live is Christ, and to die is gain, he says. So what drives Paul? What keeps him with that much focus that he can look at the potential of death for the gospel and still say, it's worth it? It's gain. I can't help but uh, struggle with this myself. I think, I think I've come to a lot of clarity in my own life and in my heart. Um, and I certainly, uh, I don't want to be so bold as to say, you know, kind of like Peter we looked at later, no matter what, no matter what, I'm here for you. I really believe I am. But I know that when we get in the, the real situations of, of persecution or even just, just when people are treating us uh, in a way that is disrespectful because of our faith. 
I know it can be tough. And so I want to challenge today, where's your focus? And how can I keep my focus? And I, I saw some things in our passage that I think I see in the Apostle Paul. So let's take a look at the first part. Um, and the first challenge I'd have you write down in your notes would be this, to look up. Look up. How do I keep focus on Christ? Look up. And look at what Paul says. He says, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. He says, I know this. There's confidence. I'm looking up. One, there is a partnership with you that I'm experiencing through your prayers. It brings me confidence. It helps me regain focus knowing that you're there in support with me. And then, of course, this this evidence in his life. He says, the spirit of Jesus is with me too, though. I'm experiencing, as we've talked through this, I'm experiencing joy. I'm experiencing peace. I'm experiencing fruit for labor. We talked last week, uh, Pastor Jason just referenced that this huge amount of people that were on the imperial guard came to the understanding of why he was imprisoned. He's seeing this evidence, but he keeps his focus to the front. And I believe it gives him confidence. But there's something else in this passage that he says. He says, I'm sure of this, that it will not all back up. He says this, it's my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by my life or my death. I love this this piece that he says. He says, look, I have an eager expectation and hope that I won't be ashamed. I believe there's there's a humility in that statement. And so as we, before I move forward and really challenge this idea of what does it take to look up, let me ask a question. Do you ever struggle with being ashamed of the gospel? And maybe you're not sure what that means. So let me give you a couple of ideas. Are you, uh, have you ever been hesitant when somebody maybe looks to you and says, man, you seem happy all the time. What's going on? There's something about you that's different. Do you dismiss that to, oh, I had a good week, a good paycheck, just, just woke up in a good mood? Or, or are you quick to, to give glory to God and say, ah, God, Jesus has redeemed me. I've been saved through his, through his sacrifice, and, and I love to be able to share this with you. Or maybe you've had a bad response, and so it's caused you to be hesitant. What is it for you, perhaps, where you've been ashamed of the gospel? Where is it for you that you've been not quick to respond with truth of what you know about Christ, but instead alter or direct the conversation so that you don't really have to engage in that aspect? I love what he says. He says, it's my eager expectation, hope that I will not be ashamed at all. There will be nothing to be ashamed of, that that with full courage I'll continue so that if they call me to an execution I'll continue to stand in this truth and be bold in my faith. But let's go into uh, a little more about looking up. Let's, let's evaluate for ourselves for a minute. I'd like to just, just kind of challenge you a little bit and talk with you. How do you look up? So, so where do you focus your attention? When you look to Jesus, when you look up to Jesus, do you see your identities in Christ or do you struggle with other identities that people have imposed on you or identities that you think you're supposed to uphold? Whether that's, oh, I'm just a this or I'm, I'm involved in this kind of work or, oh, I come from this background. What identity are you trapped in at times or are you focused on the identity that's found in Christ? And I covered that a little bit a couple of weeks ago. I encourage you to go back and look at uh, the earlier parts of Philippians. When you look up, are you focused on God's purposes or do you tend to look at how you can finish your purposes? When you look up, do you find joy? Or do you find the distraction of the difficulties around you? So I thought, let's be practical for a moment. You might write these down. First of all, I would say to help you look up, I think we clearly see this throughout Paul's writing. The first is that he had a community around him. Now, they couldn't always be in physical physical location with him, um, but they could certainly write to him, they could pray for him, and they could send messages. Some were bringing food. 
So do you have a community around you? Because see, that community around you is a way to help you keep your focus, to look up. And I think, man, there are times where we need that so bad. Secondly, I would say, are you have people praying for you and that you're praying with? You may not even see them in the physical sense because they live so far away, but you know they're there. And when you respond, they respond back. How about God's word? Are you investing time in memorization, in meditation, of looking at what God has to say in his word? He says, look, I'm giving you hope here. I'm giving you purpose. I'm giving you your identity Are you absorbing this for the transformation of your mind so that you can be focused on who you are and what God's called you to? And are you having fellowship with the Spirit? This idea that that I'm engaging with God through the Spirit and I'm sensitive to the Spirit's voice. I hear in my heart there's this movement that says, yeah, this is right or this, be careful, use caution. Because it's through that Spirit and through the fruit of the Spirit that God reveals himself in your life. Let me ask it one more little different way. What takes you off focus from looking up? Is it perhaps shame? Is there shame in your life that you feel like, I did this wrong and there's no way God could love me, so I got to figure this out or boy, I made, I made the problem. I made the bed. Now I have to sleep in it. And I'm going to, I'm going to work really hard to get this element of my life straightened out. So then I can return back to God. Or maybe in your mind, you realize that you often just rely on yourself. I'm very guilty of that. I, I, I often go directly to I can solve this, or my mental ability, I can do this, instead of first going to Jesus, looking at him and saying, I really need your help. I don't know how to solve this problem. I have ideas. But Jesus, can you transform my mind today? Can you give me your wisdom? So I want to challenge you to look up. But I want to press in at one other area. And the hard part about this one is uh, really, I, I called it glancing back. Glancing back, I I think throughout the book of Philippians, throughout a lot of the writings that Paul does, it's clear that he understands the history that he has with God. And that history helps him to have confidence to move forward. It helps him keep the focus. So he glances back. Look Look at this for a moment. First of all, where is God in your life? Where has God been in your life? If you take a look at Paul, if you went on your own to Acts 9, you could write that down, Acts chapter 9. This This is the writing about where Saul, who would become Paul, has an encounter with Jesus. And it's drastic to the point where he falls to his knees and is blinded. Remember Paul, Paul, or Saul, excuse me, Saul the persecutor? This is the guy we're talking about. He was the one persecuting He was the one giving permission to kill Christians. And he comes to faith in this miraculous way, and then everything flips. The moment he's saved, there's this whole new direction in his life. Before he was doing it for God, or so he thought, and now he's joining God in the fact that he wants to proclaim the very gospel he was persecuting. And I would say that if you look at his history, he had a great interaction with Jesus. Then we have, of course, if you go read ahead, you can do that if you'd like, Philippians 3. He talks about some of his history, some of his accolades and why he could boast, but he chooses not to. And then thirdly, there's so much evidence that he has seen in his history of God interacting with him. Just think about when we talked about Acts 16, this, here's this Philippian jailer who comes to faith. Here's Lydia. And then there's the slave girl. Go back and, and watch that or listen and, and read that for yourself. He has seen the interaction of God and the fruit of God's work in other people. So his view of what has happened in his life, I believe, gives him great confidence to say, to live as Christ and to die as gain. I've seen the evidence. I, I glance back and I go, there you are and there you've been. So, so let me ask you something. Let me ask you to write down some more things. You probably won't be able to answer all of these in the time that I have, but let me just ask you this. Let's do some evaluation. What is your story? 
Do you know your own story well? Have you spent time to really evaluate where is God? Where has God been? So here's some questions. You can write these down and then I encourage you uh, to answer them later. I know I won't give you enough time. First is, when were you saved? If you have called upon Jesus as your Lord and Savior, what was that like for you? And when did that happen? Was it a week ago, a month ago, 30 years ago? What was that like for you? Where did God protect you? Where did God protect you? Can you look back in your past and see that even when perhaps you were not pursuing God, just like me, that he still protected you from harm and from all kinds of perils and things that, would, that could have ended your life even? How about where has he provided for you? Where has God provided for you? Where has God comforted you? For some, if your journey has been short, this may be difficult to, to recognize. But for those of you who've been following long enough, who've been devoted to his word, devoted to his purposes, I believe if you begin to reflect, you will, you will be able to start seeing where God has been active in your life. So where has he comforted you? And then finally, where has he healed you? Maybe you're the recipient of a tremendous amount of healing. Or maybe you've just forgotten that even some of those injuries that seem minor, cuts to fingers and broken bones, that God was still at work healing. So where has God healed you? I love thinking about it this way, is that, see, your story is really his story. It's history. It's God's history in your life. And I believe the evidence of God in our past should give us confidence for our future. And I think we see that in Paul. I think the evidence of his past gave him great confidence to, to de declare so boldly that to live is Christ and to die is gain. Both are for his glory. And I'm, I'm sold out. I am focused on this. I desire this. And God, would you use me to fulfill your purposes? The third piece that I see today out of our text is this concept of straining forward. Straining forward. Look at what he says here. He says, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. He says, look, I could die, but I believe that I'm going to be around longer. He says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress. That I'll continue with you all for your progress. I'm here with you. I, I believe there's a forward path ahead, and I'm excited to be on this journey with God. See, I believe God, that Paul saw God's mission over his. Because he could have said, oh man, this is really hard. I don't really want to do this anymore. Is there any way out of this? Is there any way to maybe just take a break from this imprisonment. Is there something we can do? But I believe what he's saying is, look, I, I know that there's, there's a day coming where I'm going to continue with you. Maybe even not in, in person, but I'm still on the journey with you as long as I have breath. As long as I have this, I have a mission. You see, I believe that he would love to have gone out at that moment of writing this letter and said, Man, I'm leaving right now. I'm going to go back and encourage the churches. I'm going to go visit my friends and, and my fellow gospel partners. But at this point, he's still looking, going, I can't maybe do that physically, but I'm still going to continue with you. And I know that's what I'm called to do. You see, the choice to live or die is not his own. It's just the reality of those are the possible outcomes. Those are the possible outcomes while living out God's mission. He is focused. I want that focus. I want you to have that focus that no matter what you say, it's worth it. My eyes are focused and, and I want to strain forward. So let's, let's challenge ourselves for a moment. But let's finish this passage. Sorry, I'm going to go back for just a second. It says this, for me to remain in your, he says, I will continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in you, in me, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. That you can celebrate that God will continue to move, that Jesus is a part of this relationship with the two of us. 
But I wanted to bring it to you personally for a moment. I want to ask this question. How are you doing at the forward view of life? Do you have hope for the future? Do you look at God's mission and say, that's what I'm focused on? Or do you focus on your own mission, your own plans? Do you trust God for your future? That's easy to say, but sometimes it's hard to live out. So as you strain forward, keep coming back and saying, God, I know you've been active in my life. I can trust you as I go forward. That's why I love the, the blessed rhythms. And I love that Jason shared last week about someone in our congregation that, that uh, is, is in this active process and just realized, wow, I, I have been praying for this person. See, praying is, is one of the ways we keep our focus, but also stay on mission. And I have been listening to others and, and eating with them and serving and sharing the gospel and sharing my story and sharing my life with them. See, one of the ways we strain forward, one of the ways we go forward is that we understand because of who Jesus is, because of our identity in him, and because he has a plan for us we can trust based on our history, that we can have confidence to move forward. I, I know that later on in Philippians, we won't spend a lot of time in this, but Paul's going to really press in to this idea of what it means to strain forward. This isn't self-work. This is partnership with. This isn't, I can do it, watch me. This is, Holy Spirit, help me as we go together. How are you straining forward? And so I love this, go back to this joy idea. See, straining forward means I can go into every experience with this, that joy is not determined by my current situation, but by our hope in Christ. Joy is not determined by our situation, but by our hope in Christ. How do we keep that hope? How do we keep focused? We look up. We remember who Jesus is and who we are in Christ. Two, we glance back. We look back and go, wow, don't forget where God has been active. It's in the days that are the most difficult where sometimes I need a reminder that says, oh yeah, you are here even though I may not sense you're here. Oh, you do have my best interests even though the situation is horrible. Because of your, the history, I can look at it and say, God, you are faithful. And then, of course, strain forward with confidence that you are on a mission that is worthy of all things. It's worthy of our life or our death, as Paul would say. It's worthy. So I love pictures. And so eyeballs have always fascinated me. I love to look at the pupil of an eye and that, that, that beautiful color all around it. That There's such a great shade of variety in the world. But more importantly, there's this just an intricate, incredible, almost universe look there. So I just want to finish with this picture in mind. What are you focused on? In 1992, as I was focused on Jennifer, I had this unstoppable focus. My thoughts were held captive by her. My energy and preparation to find her an apartment with a roommate and a job so she would move to Hawaii, which she did do a few months later, and then we were married a couple months later after that, that this, this movement in my life at this time, this was for a human female. Now, she is wonderful, <laughs> and I'm truly blessed that today, 28 plus years later, we continue to, to learn together and grow together. But if I was willing to put that much investment in this beautiful woman in my life, how much more so should I be for the creator of the universe? How much more focused should I be? How much more willing should I be? How much more should I be willing to give up things, to shift even how my life is currently operating, to be a part of this mission? Am I willing to be focused on something greater? Well, I love you guys so much. I hope that uh, today you leave with a couple things. I want to encourage you to leave with a greater awe and wonderment of God, that you leave in worship today, that you say, wow, God, thank you for reminding me of who I am. Thank you for reminding me of, of where I've come from, and thank you that I can trust you. I love you guys. Have a great time. I'm going to release you to your campus pastors. We'll talk to you soon.
Will you manage to stick around to the end with me? I'm so glad that, so if you're watching online right now, whether you're on Sunday morning or maybe you're a few days later, or who knows when you'll get to see this. I don't think that this message uh, is only meant for a one day. I think this is a daily message that we have to continually come back to. And so I wanted to leave you with a few thoughts today just to challenge you. The first one is, is what mission are you focused on? I just want you to evaluate your life a little bit and say, wow, what is my mission? There are good missions in life, but are you focused on God's mission or is it your own mission? I think sometimes we can do good things for God. We can do good things with God. But oftentimes I think we have to evaluate the bigger question, are we really fulfilling his mission ultimately? I think one of the greatest challenges that I've had is um, I love that I get to travel the globe and, and God has given me such, such a blessing to be a part of reaching the nations with our local missionaries and our foreign missionaries. And, and in that process, I've come to realize a few things that, that when I'm on that mission, I struggle when I come back because I know that when, I'm, when I get in that plane or in that van to go to Mexico, that it's, it's like I go into this intentional focused uh, I get to leave the office and the duties of the day, and I go into this mode of just great focused mission. And I love how God interacts with me, and I grow in those times. And then I come back to my normal routine of life, and sometimes it feels like I left that. I left that mission. But I don't think that's how it's supposed to be. I think I'm supposed to live each day with that same feeling, that, that I'm on the van heading out. I'm in the plane going to that I have a mission, and every day I'm called to be a part of it. But not every day will it look uh, all that wonderful. Some days are just tough. Sometimes people don't want to talk to you, and sometimes people don't want to listen, and some days I'm just wrestling with my own self. How do I get myself back out, out of the mental funk that I'm in into the focused thinking again? So I just want to encourage you to do some evaluation. What's, are you uh, focused on God's mission? Is that really a passion for you? Or is figuring out how to survive tomorrow still occupying your time? Not that we don't need to do that, not that we don't work, but it, even in the midst of the reality of our current situations, can I have focus on God's mission? Thank you guys for joining so much. Love that you're able to, to hear a message in a variety of platforms wherever you're watching from. Have a great day. I just thought let's just close. I'd like to pray for you and encourage you to evaluate with God what your focus is for your life. Thank you, God, so much for this, uh, this image that we get today, that you, you call us to look to you, to look up to you, to remember you daily, minute by minute, hour by hour, to constantly focus on you to remember where you were in our past, to glance back and not forget your story in our lives. And finally, that you give us confidence to move forward, God. Help us to remember in the difficulty of moving forward how faithful you've been, what you've already walked us through. We, uh, we thank you. We give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen.